So I want you to think about the dates I'm going to share with you, and I want you to think about what these dates have in common. April 20th, 1999, August 5th, 2012, December 14th, 2012, June 17th, 2015, June 12th, 2016, October 1st, 2017, February 14th, 2018, March 16th, 2021, March 22nd, 2021, April 15th, 2021. Anybody hazard a, a guess at what those dates have in common? They're all, I hear some of you murmuring out there. You don't want to say it out loud, though, do you? They're all dates of mass shootings in the United States. And I skipped over a whole bunch of them. In the, just the past five weeks, there have been six public mass shootings in the United States, including massacres at three Atlanta spas, and a supermarket in Boulder, Colorado, and of course in Indianapolis, Indiana, at the FedEx facility there near the Indianapolis International Airport. Together, the shootings, these shootings have claimed 40 lives, mass shootings, multiple homicides. Welcome to life in the United States. And if that carnage isn't enough for us, according to research done by the Washington Post going back to the year 2015 about fatal shootings by police officers, black people who make up 13% of the United States population are killed at proportionally higher rates by police at a rate of 36 people per million. That means every million, for every million black people here in the United States, 36 of those people will be killed by police. Hispanics die at the hands of police at a rate of 27 people per million, and whites die at the hands of police at 15 people per million. The total deaths by a fatal police shooting since 2015 is over 5,000 people. Yes, I said 5,000. A quote attributed at various times to both Albert Einstein and Benjamin Franklin goes like this. The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. I originally had a different direction in mind for the earth care, my earth care life care sermon until Friday. It was going to be about caring for our earth and tapping into the power of the resurrection to change the world for the better. I was going to use positive examples of the Kennebunk River in Maine and the Cuyahoga River in Cleveland, which at one time were both industrial sewers with all kinds of toxic chemicals dumped into them. But now, after the passage of the Clean Water Act, though probably still not perfect, they have recovered enough that there is aquatic life back in those rivers. I was also going to talk about the years in the making polluted water disaster pouring into Tampa Bay right now from the neglected Piney Point phosphate plant in Manatee County, just north of us that is probably going to cost the state of Florida hundreds of millions of dollars to clean up due to multiple irresponsible and thoughtless owners of the business and politicians. For a pretty complete recounting of that horror story, check out the coverage in the Tampa Bay Times. But as important as those natural environment stories are, what is, what is it about us as citizens of the United States that allow us to keep our head in the sand about a political and cultural environment in which citizens of these United States 
are murdered with such great ease and such great frequency. Don't misunderstand me. There is nothing new under the sun here. We humans all through history have been adept at violating God's commandment of thou shalt not kill. One only needs to read brief bits of history across thousands of years of history to realize the great appetite we have for destruction of each other for purposes of power and financial gain. The gospel text before us today is an opportunity to step into some really good news about Jesus, right? We're in the season of Easter. The Lord is risen. However, we need to remember what had just happened to Jesus and, in fact, why he needed to be resurrected. He had just been murdered. The story immediately preceding the gospel text you heard a few moments ago is the story of two disciples on their way to Emmaus talking about Jesus being killed on a cross. Or as I would say it, murdered by state sanctioned by a state sanctioned act of terrorism. Is it too harsh a reminder of what happened to Jesus during the week that we call holy? Remember the Christ, the cross was used to strike fear into the hearts of a nation's citizens. It was a cruel instrument of death to keep the citizens of an occupied country docile thereby allowing Rome to maintain firm control of that territory and to be able to strip its wealth through taxes. Over my years in ministry, how many times in how many churches have I heard people tell me not to get too political because Jesus wasn't political. My answer has always been, if Jesus was not political, then why was he killed by the politicians, read religious leaders, of his own people who handed him over to the Roman politicians, who handed him over to the Roman army to nail him to a cross? If that's not a political act of murder to, to protect the power of the state, I don't know what is. If, in a more pleasant view of politics, we say politics is the process in which a community of people come together and establish a system of governance that allows us to live in peace and harmony together, in which all people have a voice and rights and attempt to live together in peace, then isn't that also a political statement? And isn't that also something that Jesus would be interested in? And so we have these disciples still in shock from the arrest and murder of Jesus, in that upper room, not sure what to do next. Early in their day, some women had been to the tomb and returned telling the story about the stone being rolled away, and two men in gleaming white who had asked them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He isn't here, but has been raised. Once again, as you've heard me say before, women are the first evangelist in Scripture. But alas, upon their return to the disciples, the women reported what these two men had said, and the disciples believed it was like it was the gospel truth. A few of you chuckled. No, they didn't. They thought, they're telling us an idle tale. Keep after us, ladies. We'll figure it out someday. 
So what does any of that have to do with mass murder and out-of-control police violence? You're not going to like the answer. It's in verse 48, and I admit I've taken it a little bit out of context, but it goes like this. You are witnesses of these things. We are witnesses of these things. As people of faith who are witnessing our brothers and sisters mowed down by seemingly unending gun violence, how long are we going to allow this carnage to continue? How long are we going to continue telling ourselves the lie that the problem is too big and there's nothing that can be done about it? Do we really believe in earth care, life care, or are we just whistling in the dark while people that God loves are murdered? No doubt some of you may be troubled right now at how I'm speaking. Someone might even be thinking that, I know he's going to say we're going to defund the police. I am not saying that we should defund the police. But can't we say that something has gone wrong when a unit of government government that is supposed to guard public safety has killed over 5,000 citizens in six years? Now, I'm relatively immune to police violence Because I'm white. But if I was a black father and I had black children, I would be terrified for myself and I would be terrified for my children every time I went out into public. We had a little discussion after the first service this morning. And I would still be standing in front of you today if the registration on my car was, had been expired and I had been pulled over. That's not the case for the young man in Minnesota who was killed because a 26-year veteran of the police department there couldn't tell the difference between a pistol and a stun gun, a taser. Well, and if that's not disturbing enough, you might be thinking, well, Pastor Mike, looking at the mass murder situation, that 19-year-old who shot up all those people in the FedEx uh, building in Indianapolis was going to get a gun one way or another, and nothing could be done about it, except maybe more common sense gun laws designed to keep a weapon out of his hands. In fact, his own mother reported him to the police last year because he was talking about suicide by cop, doing something in front of a police officer that would get him shot. He was investigated, and in fact, his shotgun was confiscated by the police, and he underwent a psych evaluation, and yet something in the system failed, and he didn't get the help he needed. And he legally bought two guns last year, even though Indiana has a red flag law. And then he killed eight people and wounded several others before killing himself. So how about it? For the safety of all of us, could we pay a few more dollars in taxes to fund a mental health system that can follow up with a young man who is having a mental health breakdown and is a danger to others and to himself? I'd pay a few more dollars for that. Or how about a mental health system that gets a person off the street and gets them the help that, they, that he or she needs so that a police officer doesn't have to make a split-second life-or-death decision when confronting that individual? as happened in Immokalee. 
not that long ago. And let's not talk about defunding the police. Let's figure out how to train and hi- or hire and train police officers to de-escalate a potentially violent situation with someone experiencing a mental, mental health breakdown or give officers access to a rapid response mental health team who have extensive training, who can intervene in in a situation before it escalates into violence. We train officers for SWAT teams. Why can't we have individuals, have teams of individuals trained to be rapid mental health response teams? How about we as a church figure out how to speak to the people we elect and instead of demanding tax cuts for the rich, we say we're willing to pay more in order to create a community-wide system, a nationwide system in which people and families can get the kind of mental health care they need before someone hurts someone else or hurts themselves. In the original direction of my sermon, I was going to have some fun with the title, Are You Being Ghosted? For those of you not familiar with the slang, how many of you are familiar with that slang? Uh, Just as I thought. (laughs) Not many. Well, basically it means you're not returning the calls of someone you've been dating or not returning the calls of someone you want to avoid or not returning the calls of somebody that you work with because you just don't want to deal with them. But today, instead, I can definitively make the claim that we are all being ghosted. Every six, four, or two years, we have politicians that ask us for our vote. They make promises to us, and they tell us how wonderful they'll be for us, representing our interest in Washington, D.C., or Tallahassee, or at City Hall, or at the county commissioner's office, and we vote for them. Then, particularly at higher levels of government, they ghost us. They accept large financial donations from special interest groups because they, after all, have to run for re-election again, and they need money to do that. And so they accept these gifts from people like the gun lobby who want to make sure that the status quo of the gun culture in the United States is maintained so that they can continue to sell guns. And I dare say, and I haven't read the statistics this time, but I bet gun sales have come up because people have heard the talk about, oh, we want to ban the sale of guns. So gun dealers are out there raking in the cash. Heaven forbid a gun manufacturer would be sued by someone after a mass shooting in which their weapon with a 100 round magazine was used in that murder or in those murders. Or heaven forbid we would allow the Center for Disease Control to do some research on how to reduce the incidence of gun violence in the United States. Or heaven forbid we actually get our representatives at the state and federal level to pass some no-nonsense gun laws in our nation and in our states. And locally, why can't a task force of citizens and police officers and county and city officials get together, engage in some fact-finding, and then have some frank discussions about how we can improve community policing in our neighborhoods? Policing that would make our communities safer it would make us a citizen safer, and that would make our police offers, officers safer. I'm not sure how we get to a safer, more sane society, but I believe if we have the will, that we can do it. That we can move forward and make this a safer 
place for everyone. How many of you have ever poked a hornet's nest? I guess I'm the only one. Oh, okay. There you go. All right. I learned how fast I could run that day. It's not a wise thing to do. Well, not only have I poked the hornet's nest this morning, I've knocked it down and I've hit it with a two by four. I may have stirred a few things up. And I want you to know that even though I'm going to take a few, maybe two questions after the sermon, we also don't want to be here to three or four o'clock this afternoon because it's an issue that gets people excited on one side or the other. So questions after the sermon, but after the service is over, if you have more questions, comments about this sermon or about the whole issue in general, I will stay here and we will keep the live feed running. So if there's some folks out there on Facebook that are watching this that have some questions, they can send them in to us and we'll try to answer those questions. But I'll stay right here after the service until everyone is heard. So I just offer that up to you. I want, you to, I want to leave you with something else to ponder. Jesus, the Son of God, came that all might have life and have it what? Abundantly. You all know it. We remember that the abundance of his life was cut short when he was violently tortured and murdered in an act of state-sponsored terrorism. One would think that after his resurrection, he would come back to kick some butt and take some names, right? It's the way of the world. That wasn't the case. Listen again to this passage from Luke. Listen to the first thing that he says to them. While they were saying these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said, Peace be with you. They were terrified and afraid. They thought they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, why are you startled? Why are your doubts arising in your hearts? Look at my hands and feet. It's really me. Touch me and see, for a ghost doesn't have flesh and bones like you see I have. As he, showed, as he said this, he showed them his hand, hands and feet. Because they were wondering and questioning in, in the midst of their happiness. He said to them, do you have anything to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish. Taking it, he ate it in front of them. Jesus said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law from Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then, and I like this line too, then he opened their minds to understand the Scripture. He said to them, this is what is written, the Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and a change of heart and life for the forgiveness of sins must be preached in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I don't know about you, all of you, but I could use a great big canister of peace be with you after the year we've gone through with COVID and with the violence that is returning to our streets. I hope that I or Roy or any other pastor never again has to step in front of a congregation and preach another sermon after another shooting by a police officer or another mass shooting as we pray for and we mourn with those families whose loved one won't walk through the door tonight, who don't understand why their loved one is gone, and someone else's loved one is safe. We do need to pray for those families. We do need to pray for our nation. We also 
need to act. We also need to speak up. And we need to proclaim the Prince of Peace in our words and in our actions. Peace be with you. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.